Our daughter, Summer, turns three in June, which means we're in the middle of potty training. How many of you have fond memories of potty training? Raise your hand. Or, or just memories at all? Yes, any kind of memory of potty training. One of our, one of our strategies is that every night before she goes to bed, um, if she sits on the potty and does all the things, she gets to pick a prize, a potty prize, from a box. So Rebecca had bought some cheap toys and put them in a box in the closet, our game closet. So she gets all excited before bed. She wants a prize. She goes to the bathroom. She gets a prize. I don't get a prize. <laughs> um, but, but, but she gets a prize. Uh, but what we, quickly, what we quickly learned is that it, as excited as she is for a prize, and she looks at the prizes and she picks the one she wants, about 30 minutes later or so, that initial excitement, that initial you know, uh, thrill of that newness of that prize, it, it kind of disappears and goes away. Uh, and, and so what we noticed also is that she, she moved past the prizes in the box to just picking random things in the closet. So it's a game closet, so we have board games, so she picks board games, uh, and, we, and so we decided we don't have to buy more prizes. <laughs> she can just pick what's in the closet, and then when that excitement goes away, we just pack it back up and put it back in the closet uh, for her to pick in another time. <laughs> right? I don't know if that's... I don't know what that's going to do to her mentally when she gets older, but hey, we're, it's good for now. Uh, this, this kind of idea uh, of getting excited and having a lot of zeal um, for something that's new, and then that newness and excitement kind of disappearing or dissipating over, over time, uh, it, it's kind of human nature. So this is a little, like little bit of it we see in summer, but how many of you have ever experienced that? I know I have. You, you want something new, maybe, maybe like a car, so you research, you save, you're excited about it, uh, and then you get it, and it's all exciting, and then quickly that excitement is gone, uh, and you're on to what's, what's next, what's the next thing. I remember years ago I lived in a condo in Tempe, and all I wanted was a garage. I remember praying, God, I just want a garage, right? A garage would be great. And then I bought a house in Gilbert that had a garage. And I was like, oh, man, this is it, right? I got a garage. And then quickly I was like, ah, I really would like a swimming pool, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, so now I have a house with a swimming pool. And sometimes I'm like, it would be nice to live on a lake, <laughs> right? So, so it's just part of who we are to like, lose that initial excitement over something new. And so today, as we, as we dive into the church in Ephesus, which is the first church of the seven, uh, that we're going to be looking at through, through our journey here through these churches, we're going to see that that issue is something that they're facing, that they've forgotten what it's like to be new to, to their faith. And in that, in, the, in that forgetting, they forgot what their purpose is, which is to love people. Uh, and, and, and God is calling them and us to remember what that's like and to live life with a focus of love for one another, uh, and for the world. And so we'll, we'll see that today. So if you want to turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, thanks, Donna, for reading our, part of our passage today. Um, I liked that translation, by the way. This is the church to Ephesus, the, the message to the church in Ephesus 2, 1 through 7. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have preserved, oh, persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had had first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So there's a lot in each of these messages um, that that may not make a lot of sense when you first read it. Uh, but what we want to do through this, 
through going through these churches is to go on a little journey. And I'll show you some pictures and things so you can really understand what he's talking about, like you would if you were uh, in the church of Ephesus in the first century. But most importantly, we want to say, what does that mean for me today? What does it mean for me in my life today? And as I go through this week, what should I be thinking about and understanding um, so that it impacts what I do and who I am for what God wants for us? Because the message that he's giving to this church back in first century, you know, uh, Asia Minor um, is, is the same lessons that we need to learn today in our lives in, in Las Palmas in Mesa, Arizona. So first of all, let me tell you a little bit about Ephesus as a background. Um, Ephesus is a coastal city. You'll see it right here. Um, it's one of the largest cities in Rome at the time. It's in Asia Minor. This is where we are. These are our seven churches, uh, which is modern-day modern day Turkey. Um, and it's a city of like 250,000 plus people. So it's a huge city. It's on the coast. It has a lot of commerce, a lot of temples, a lot of business, a lot of tourism. Think of San Diego. Right? So Ephesus is very, and, and from all human perspective, the, 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 ta- the city is flourishing. It's doing well. It has a lot of, uh, this, a lot's happening. A lot's happening in, in, in Ephesus at this time. It's a place, it's a place that you would want to be. Um, there's, there's three main, three big things that Ephesus was known for, and one is the Artemis temple and cult. So you can see by scale, if this is this, you know, the ground, this temple was huge. It was actually one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And if you study Ephesus, uh, and so if you read Acts 19, the letter to the Ephesians that we have in the New Testament, or First and Second Timothy, Timothy was a pastor in Ephesus, um, part of the background that you learn is about the Artemis cult. It was a huge part of the culture there. The temple even acted like a bank uh, for the community. Um, it, was, it, it was just the culture was enmeshed around this Artemis cult and practice um, at the time. It was very, very prominent. And people would actually pilgrimage to Eph- uh, Ephesus just to see this temple. Uh, that's how big of a deal it was in that time. A, here's a quote from an ancient historian. It says, I have set eyes on the wall of lofty Babylon, on which is a road for chariots, and the statue of Zeus by the, by the Alpheus, and the hanging gardens, and the Colossus of the Sun, and the huge labor of the high pyramids, and the vast tomb of Mausolus. But when I saw the house of Artemis that mounted to the clouds, those other marvels lost their brilliancy. And I said, lo, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked on anything so, so grand. Um, so you can see there's many more quotes that we even have from other ancient historians about about this temple and the impact that this, this Artemis cult had in Ephesus. So that's part of the background here. The second thing that they're known for is the imperial cult. So if you were a city in ancient Rome, you could compete to be a temple keeper, uh, which means you would build a, a, a temple to Caesar, so you could worship Caesar from your temple, uh, and you'd get special privileges from Rome. So Ephesus was also one of those. Uh, so again, it was a very prominent city, very big city, a lot of tourism. It even had special favor from Rome. It's, it's a very big deal in this time and place. And the third thing that it was known for was, was magical writings. So it actually was renowned for magical writings. So think of spells or incantations, um, witchcraft, um, all these different types of things. Um, it was very known for this. People would go there uh, to get books and scrolls. To do, to do curses for people and things like that. Um, they thought they could control spirits. They think they could create success for people or failures uh, or, or create love, you know, matches, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, so even though Ephesus was very big and very uh, like bustling at the time, um, it was also very dark and very demonic. So can you imagine a place that's very successful and by all human perspectives doing well but also very dark and, and demonic at the same time. It's, it's like the world, right? It's, it's like the world. Uh, and so even as we think about where we live today in our society and, and how things, good things can be going, um, we, gotta, we gotta remember there's still darkness out there. And we gotta remember that underneath a lot of that could be spiritual forces that are influencing. 
uh, and we just have to be, be aware. So as we look at Ephesus, we want to remember, we want to remember these things. Paul also has a, there's also a biblical background for this. Um, so in Acts 19, we see Paul's in Ephesus. So Paul spent a lot of time here. Again, it was a really big city. It was a big deal for Paul. He was there for a long time. Uh, and as, he, as people converted to Christianity, and they were excited about the newness of, of, of who Jesus is, of understanding that they were forgiven, that they're loved by God, and, and, and they've moved from this darkness uh, and this uh, like witchcraft to, to new life, and that, that, that initial excitement and zeal and enthusiasm for understanding who God is, they, they, they took all of their books and scrolls and they burned them um, to, to, to show that they've moved to a, to a new type of existence, moved past something old that they had to put away and put on something new, which was their life in Christ. Um, so put off the old and put on the new. And as you can see, this is Acts 19. Um, 18 and 19, it says, Also many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it to came to 50,000 pieces of silver, which is equal to 50,000 days of work, uh, which, is, which is a long time, right? <laughs> which is a very long time. So it's costly. So this excitement and the newness of, of conversion, of knowing God, of understanding his forgiveness and his love in their lives moved them to, to, to burn all their, 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 kind of their old life away. Uh, and it was costly. It was very costly. Because, I mean, they could, have, they could have sold them, right? It's something different. So what we want to do as we, as we walk through now this message uh, to the church, if you remember last week, I said each of these little messages have a structure to them. And so we want to quickly touch on this structure so you can see uh, what each of these are for, for the Ephesians. But most importantly, what does it mean for, for you today? How do you take the message that was originally given to the Ephesians and say, what does this mean for me right now in my life as I'm living at Las Palmas or in Mesa or Gilbert, Arizona in 2024? Um, so the, the first piece here is the Christ title. This is 2-1 again. It says, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So the, there's two parts to this. The first part is the golden lampstand, or the second part, but the one I'm going to talk about first is the golden lampstands. In chapter 1, that represents the church. So the churches are the lampstands. So that's a statement of Christ's intimacy and connection with the church. So when you think of the church overall throughout, throughout time, Christ is the head of the church. He is part of what we do in the world. What, what the church does is what Christ is doing in the world. But he's also intimately connected in each individual church as well. So each local church, like here, at, here in Las Palmas, Christ is, is intimately involved in what we do. What we do as a community, what we do individually, is a part of that wholeness of the church. It's a part of what Christ is doing in the world. And, and, and we need to remember that. He's intimately connected and involved in the church. The second part, it says he holds this, or the first part of the thing, but the second part, it says that he holds the seven stars in his right hand. That is a statement of power and authority. So in ancient Rome, you can see here's three coins uh, that, were, that were printed during the time. And on one side, you have a picture of the, the Caesar, or this is um, Domitia, the wife of the emperor. And on this other half, you see seven stars uh, in different, different ways. See, the seven stars in ancient Rome represented authority. It represented power. It represented ultimately, ultimate, ultimate authority. So what Jesus is saying here in his title is that not only is he intimately involved in the church, but he has all the power in the universe, which, which is both encouraging uh, for us uh, and, and, and gives us a little bit of a, a caution as well. It's encouraging um, because Christ is intimately involved in the church. He's here with us. He's, he's a part of what we're doing in the world. Uh, and we can be encouraged that he has all power and authority. So no matter who is in charge, so if you were the church back then and the emperor was in charge and you lived in that kind of world, or if you lived in today's world in, in America where we have a president, or in another part of the, country, the world where it could be different or, or even worse, 
the encouragement is Christ is ultimately in control of everything. He's ultimately in control. So the, the worry and anxieties and fear that we sometimes get because of the, uh, what's happening in the world or even our government, Jesus is saying to the church in Ephesus, I have all power and control. I have all power. I hold the stars. I'm the one. You don't have to worry about all that. Ultimately, I have it all handled. And we need to, we need to remember that. It's an encouragement to us that he's intimately present and that he's all-powerful and in control. But it's also a caution. It's a caution because he's intimately connected with us and he has all power and control. We serve, we serve a God who is full of love, who's forgiven us, who wants us to be on mission in the world. And because he's present with us, he wants to, he wants to see us be on mission in the world. He wants us to have that excitement and enthusiasm we had at first and to, to keep living that out in, in the world today. And his presence here and knowing he has all authority should give us more compelling reasons to go out and be lights in this world and to love each other and to love the world because the world is dark. And again, no matter what's happening in the world, we need to lean on this truth that, that he is ultimately in charge. He's the one with all the, with all the power. The second part that is the commendation. They're doing some things really good. They're, they're good students. So they're, they're, they're very orthodox in what they know and understand. This is, this is um, the second part here. It says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Uh, that's two and three. And then verse six, he says, yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. What's he saying? He's saying you, you've, you've dove into scripture and you have a good foundation of theology. Um, they, they, they've learned a lot. Actually, Paul, when he was in Ephesus in Acts 20, 29, he, he warns them that there'll be wolves that will come uh, to lead them astray, and they need to be ready. And so they, they took that to heart, and they, and they, and they doubled down on their studies, uh, and they have a good theological foundation for, for what they are. So that's a good thing. He's commending them for that. To, to know more about God is, is good. It's good. He also tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4, he says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into, into myths. So what we see here is that Timothy did a good job, and the, and the church did a good job learning about God, which is good, and you need to, right? That's something that's a good thing to dive into his word and say, God, let me, let me, let me know you more. Let me know you more. And so they did it well. They actually did it too well, because they, in, their, in their learning, in their education, uh, they forgot what it was like to, what they did at first, what it was like to first be a Christian and to, and to be all about love. You see, when you, when you think, think back about John, last week we talked about how, how he went from the, you know, the son of thunder uh, to the beloved apostle to somebody in his letters talking about love uh, and, and, and abiding in Christ more than any other New Testament author. And then we also see in his gospel that he's a deep thinker. He's thinking about the Trinity and about Jesus and what he, what he meant for him in his life. And so, so for John, the, the tying... Of, of, of leaning in and learning more about God and studying his word leads to loving people more, to be more excited about who God is, to be a part of his work in the world. But what we're seeing here in Ephesus is they forgot, they forgot about that second part. Uh, and they became a well-educated holy huddle, right? <laughs> kind of insulating themselves from the, from the world. Uh, and he mentions the Nicolaitans, which was like a false teaching group that came in, and they were able to quickly say, no, that's not right. And, and get them away. So that's good. It's a good thing. But the complaint, which is the next line, 2-4, it says, yet I, have, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. 
think in the passage that Donna read in her version, it says you forgot to love. You forgot about loving each other and loving others. They forgot about love. If you remember when Paul says there's, there's three things that are really important, which is faith, hope, and love, and the greatest is love. And God is love, right? So they forgot what it's like to be, to be a new Christian. They forgot what it was like to have that enthusiasm, the excitement. They were like summer picking that prize out of the box, right? And, and quickly that, that, that excitement disappeared. And so now they're just a well-educated, insulated group of people who aren't impacting themselves or, or the society around them. And Jesus says that's, that's, that's not okay. So there's a correction. That's the next part of the, of the passage. He says, remember from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at, at first. So there's, there's three parts here. He says, remember, remember when you were first believers. Remember how you burned all those, all those books and scrolls because you were so excited about your new life in Christ and you wanted to get rid of the old and, and jump into new and show show the world who you were, and and you wanted people to feel and experience what you're feeling. Remember that? Okay, repent and go back there, and then do it, and then live it in your life. So, So right now, I want you to do this. I want you to close your eyes. Hopefully not fall asleep, but close your eyes. And I want you to remember when you first became a believer. Remember when you first became a believer, or remember a time in your life when you were excited about being a believer. And, and the things that you did and what you felt and how you couldn't help but want to share it with those around you. And you had a zeal and enthusiasm for, for saying, man, if, if I can get the people around me to experience what I've experienced, how amazing is that? C- can you remember? Jesus is saying to the church in Ephesus and to us today, you've got to remember that. And then bring that back in your life and, and then do it. <laughs> remember repent and do. Repeat that after me. Remember, Remember. repent, and then do it. Do it. So just like he's calling them to get back to that excitement, enthusiasm, and zeal in their life, that message is for us today too. Because how often, again, like it's human nature, we, we get comfortable, we tend to forget that excitement, that enthusiasm, and, and really the question is what can you do in your life on a daily basis, after chapel today, this throughout this week, as you're living, thinking about, man, how do, how, what what do I, how do I make decisions? How do I treat people? How do I talk to somebody? What, what can I do to show people the love of Christ that, that's in me, the love that he pours in me, he's forgiven me, and it's amazing, and I want other people to, to be a part of that. At the same time, we balance, it's a tension that we hold to grow more and to learn, but also to live it out in our lives and what we, what we do every, every single day. He's calling them to do, to do both. And the next kind of phase here of the pattern is the consequence. There's a negative and a positive consequence for this. This is actually a good feedback uh, loop, by the way. Hey, here's one good thing. Here's one bad thing. Here's how to fix it. If you don't fix it, here's what will happen. If you do fix it, here's a, a reward. You can try that in your life, right? It'll it'll, it'll work really well. Um, But the negative, he says this, if you don't repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So what's he saying? If the lampstand is the church, what's he saying? If you don't remember who you were, if you don't live the Christian life out and be on mission, I don't need you. I'll I'll just remove you because you represent me in the world. And if you're representing me as, as a group of people that just want to sit there and learn and insulate yourself from the world, and you forget the most important thing, which is loving each other and loving the world, then, then you, just don't, you just don't need to be there anymore. And that sounds harsh. That sounds harsh. But we read that, and that's to that church, but again, it's for, it's for us today as well. If we want to be a group of people, a, a church that's known... For, for living life, for experiencing this world, this hard, dark world, but differently because we're in Christ and we have his love in us, then, then we need to do it. Then we need to do it. We need to learn about him and grow and then, and then show that in our lives 
in, in our world. There's a positive outcome too. He says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. What's he talking about? He's talking about participation. Participation in the kingdom of God. You get to be in Christ and you get to live life in the kingdom of God. You get to be a part of the Eden experience that, that, that Jesus has for you even now in this broken world with the hope of being a part of that for all, all of eternity. And if you can remember and, and live it, then you get to experience it and you get to live life that's, that's different in the world because your, your love is shining and you're an example and you're drawing people into, into that kingdom. What's also interesting about him saying this is that the Artemis cult, if you remember, it's a big deal here in Ephesus. One of the main parts of the Artemis cult is the idea of a sacred tree. So part of the Artemis cult is this idea of a sacred tree and that tree being a part of that whole religion. So for him to mention you get to be a part of the tree of life here is actually um, an opposition to the Artemis cult directly. So if you were in Ephesus in the day, you would, that would be in your mind and you would understand what he's saying is the participation in God's kingdom in that tree of life is, is way better than participation in this huge cult in their, in their sacred tree. Everything that has to do with Jesus is, is greater than anything we can get or experience in the world. No matter how big it is, no matter how exciting it is, no matter how thrilling it looks, or, or no matter how much the city or town or country or whatever is doing well, everything be going well from a human perspective, but God can still be like, where's the love? <laughs> where, where, where are my people? And what are you doing in the world to shine and to show who I am. So for us today, there's a significance to this, and that's these two things. We have to continue to grow in truth, and these are in your bulletin there. We have to continue to grow in truth. They were commended for that, and we can't miss that part of it. Again, for John, the more he reflected deeply and understood Jesus, the more he loved him and, and, and wanted others to love him and live that way as well. So we got to be a part of that. So right, maybe right in your bulletin, what can you do this week, today, as you're, as you're thinking about things in your own life that you can do to learn more? Is it, oh, I need, to, I need to dig in and read my Bible every day. I just need to maybe pick a book and study it. I need to come to a Bible study. Uh, like, what is it in your life that you can do to say, I, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of getting to know God more. I want to spend time in prayer every day. I just want to you know, sit outside uh, alone and, and meditate and think about God and, and what he's done for me in my life? Like, how, how can you practically do that in your life today? There's a lot of ways. And the second part is we have to continue to grow in love. This is where they forgot. <laughs> this is where they, and, and this is, again, like human nature, we tend to forget the excitement of things that are new. And again, he wants us to repent or to remember, right, to remember what was that like, like you just thought about to repent, to go back to that, to go back to that time in your life and to live it out, to be that person. So maybe you write down in your bulletin, how can you do that this week? Even today, as you, as you leave here, as you go out into the world, what are things that you can do to show your love and excitement for your faith in Christ? He wants you to live this. It's, it's participation in the kingdom. It's not just coming to chapel, learning some things, and being part of a, a holy, well-educated huddle, uh, but it's impact for you and the, and the world around you. More truth should equal more love. Should equal more love, because the more we understand how sinful we are and how much we've been forgiven and how deeply and infinitely God loves us, the more excited we should be to, to share that with those around us in the world. We've got to remember where we came from, that we were once lost too, and, and, and be part of his mission in the world to help people meet, know, and follow Jesus. So today and this week, how can you remember the excitement of the newness of being a Christian? The excitement of pulling that prize out of the box, right, when you first became a Christian, uh, and instead of letting it disappear, how can I keep refreshing that and encouraging that even within my family or my community every single day? How can we have the zeal and enthusiasm 
to demonstrate the love of Christ in your life. That's what Jesus was calling the church in Ephesus to do, and that's what he's calling us to do today. Let me pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth that we can dive in to this, to this book and know you more. I just pray for all of us that you'll help us continue to think about who you are and really think about what that means for our life. I pray for all of us today, Lord, that we can remember what it was like to be new in you, to be excited for salvation, to put off things even, even in a sacrificial way. And then, and then to be on mission for you in the world, to be a participant in your kingdom as we live. I just pray for refreshment and renewal in all of us, Lord, that we can live this life as lights of yours in the world, and we can love in all the decisions and the things that we do through this week. In Jesus' name, amen.